first off, I just wanna, I wanna open up, you know, uh, I wanna thank the people that have been planted in Christ. Also, I wanna be able to thank the people that have been planted in this house, in this ministry. Let me just tell you guys something. There's a lot of people going from one place to another, to another, to another, to another, to another. They'll get fed here, they'll get fed there. But I personally would not be here today if it wasn't for the people that we don't see, the people that do things in the background, in community. And just the family that has been able to even believe in the vision that's on this house, this soil, this ministry. Now we're not a gang. I'm not saying, oh, our ministry is better than that. That's not what it's about. We're all part of Team Jesus. But God has given assignments to every house. He's given assignments to every ministry out there. And I just want to give honor where honor is due to those that have been planted. Because I'm going to tell you, you cannot bear fruit unless you've gotten roots. And wherever you guys are sowing, there's people that come in week by week. They, they fly from all over the place that come see us. They've seen us online and uh, they're pouring into their local ministries. But can I just tell everyone here, there is power in community. The reason why we all need to be planted in a physical house, I don't know why I'm speaking this or sharing this, but this is something the Holy Spirit put on me before I even came into here. But there's power in being planted. Because when I'm planted long enough, I grow roots. The seeds break so that roots can grow and those roots allow me to grow fruits. So being planted, and I'm telling people, if you're getting fed at a local ministry, pour in right back. As they're serving you, go serve that house. With your talents, your time, your tides, your resources, your gifts, your skills, you're going to get to a place where you're going to get so developed that you're not going to be taking fruits from that house. You're going to be bearing fruit from that house. You guys see the power of this. There's reason why being planted in Christ above all and then being planted in a healthy church, a healthy ministry. There's a lot of churches out there that aren't really in, walking in the fear of God. They've compromised. So it's hard to find a healthy church. It's hard to find healthy leaders and healthy people that actually care for your soul. So I grieve for these people. I grieve for people that are looking and have been used and, 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 and misused. Now they're running from God because of other people that aren't even being used by God. I tell people, why you let everybody use you. Why not let God use you in this next season? So there's power in being able to be planted and grow roots so that you can bear fruit. Now there's reasons, I'm not gonna go, this is not the message today, but I just felt led to share this because too many of us, let me get planted here and there and there and there. Oh, I got, I got uh, breakfast there. I'm getting the main course there. I'm getting dessert at this place. Get planted somewhere. Get planted. In a Netflix and chill generation, commitment is like a word we're allergic to. Get committed when it's with your relationship with God. And I'll tell you why you have to do this. To, to be planted and get deeply rooted in a community, one of the reasons is because of community. Community, some of us also need covering. Only God can cover me. God gonna cover you. But you also need spiritual covering from others that have walked it. Day in, day out. Even me, Brother RC up here. I need covering spiritually from elders for people that are assigned to cover me. If you want to be able to walk out what God has for you, you're going to need covering for that because I'll tell you, you can't do it alone. You need covering with someone that actually cares for your purpose, cares for your calling, cares for the assignment that God has placed in your life. And I'll tell you another thing, counseling. Community, covering, you need counseling. Proverbs 12, it says, if we do not like instruction, if we don't like instruction or correction, what's the point? He who hates correction, Proverbs chapter 12 in New King James says, he who hates correction is stupid. So what I'm sharing here is not my will, not my word. It's backed up by the word of God. And you could test it. 
You could test it. This, this is between you and the Lord. But I believe that the only reason I was able to bear fruit is because I've been deeply rooted in a place where people actually care and pour and they see the vision. So I'm thanking every person in here publicly and I thank them privately for being able, even before, and I'm going to tell you, I'm standing up here today getting access to places and spaces that I wouldn't have been able to get alone. Let me just tell you, having a relationship with God will give you access to things that degrees and money can't give you access to. And having a community of people that you can be able to build with is so much greater than what we can do with ourselves. We're talking about counterfeits. Today we're in part six. Counterfeits, counterfeits. Okay, this counterfeit series. And the reason why is because I want to be able to have us expose the fakers, the takers, the users, the abusers. A counterfeit was made to deceive us. That's why they make the counterfeit dollar. And we, we've been talking this, uh, uh, about this a lot. We try to study counterfeits more than the real thing. The people that are experts in studying counterfeits, they don't study all the different counterfeits. They study the real dollar. Why? Because the moment you study one fake, one counterfeit, a thousand other counterfeits come to the marketplace. That's what we try to do when it comes down to the word of God. We study this religion, that religion. You don't even know the Bible. I just got to study the real deal so I can discern the difference between truth and fake. And when I know the truth, I can discern the difference between this and that. We don't play church. We are the church. It's one, it's good to be in church. It's greater to be the church. When you're being the church, it's your character, it's your fruit. It's really loving others, even though they don't deserve it sometimes. It's honoring others. It's being able to help others and to serve others. I want to go to Romans at chapter eight. Today, I'm going to talk about this. This is in part six of counterfeits. The question is, are you a carnal Christian? Are you a carnal Christian? Because I got my Bible in one hand, but I got an alcoholic drink on the other hand. The Bible tells us when you have these carnal tendencies, you're still a babe in Christ. You're still carnal. Now, I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm just here to share what the word says and so that you can be mature and you can develop. Because if you want to continue to crawl in your walk with Christ, continue to be a babe. But if you want to walk and you want to run this race with endurance and you want to be able to build and grow and bear fruit, it's going to be time for us to be able to mature and develop. There's something about that. The gates of hell, the enemy, he doesn't care we're in church. What the enemy does not want us to do is mature and grow up. He's okay with you being in church as a babe saying, goo goo gaga, mine, mine, mine. But it's time to develop language around my situation. It's time to develop discernment around my situation. And it's so easy to, 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 to be able to be deceived by counterfeits. When you're a baby and you're just like, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. You, you don't even discern. You just start eating anything and everything. That's not food, but you still eat it. So it's time to grow up and it's time to level up. My question today, are you a carnal Christian? And we're going to go deep. We're actually going to study the word. Okay, Romans 8, chapter, five, chapter 8, verse 5. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Okay, this is good. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. The carnal mind is an enemy, and it, it is against God, okay? Verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. When I'm operating in the flesh, you cannot please God. Verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. 
But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now we have to audit ourselves. Are we, are we walking in the, the flesh or the spirit? Now, what is the flesh? The flesh is this, this body that we live in. It's, it's our earth suit today. So the flesh, no, un, until we leave and we get caught up with Lord Jesus, until we leave this earth, we're always going to be with the flesh. The, the, the flesh are the things that we do that we don't want to do, yet we do. But the things I di- desire to do, this is what Apostle Paul says right before this in Romans 7. He says, but the things that I, I desire to do, I don't do. Or that I want to do, or I must do, I don't do. So I'm warring against this thing. The flesh and the spirit are warring against one another. There are people that can't surrender because of your flesh. You love the sound of worldly music and how it makes you feel. You love being led by your emotions. Or you're going to be led by the spirit of God, the he that is within me, that is greater than he that is within this world. I'm not telling us to be perfect. We are progressing. We are growing up. We're getting better. We're getting sharpened. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, iron sharpens iron. So a friend will sharpen a friend. This is why community is so important. And when you sharpening stuff, iron sharpening iron, sing, 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 right? There's heat. You go from dull to sharp and you get to cut through things. Sometimes your words may cut others because you're so sharp in the spirit, but it will set them free. But I cannot please God when I'm walking in the flesh. Okay. A few weeks ago, we talked about the different voices that are out there. Okay. Is this God's voice? We talked about the the counterfeit voices that are out there. There's four voices we're hearing. Number one, the first voice is the devil. Matthew chapter four, Jesus heard the devil while he was fasting, right? Number two is the voice of the world. The voice of the world. Romans 12, 12, two, do not be conformed by the world. Do not be influenced by the world. That's the world has a voice. And then the, the, the third type of voice is what? The flesh. This is, is it me? You know how we pray that prayer in Isaiah? No weapon formed against me shall prosper in the name of Jesus. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. What if the weapon that's being formed is you coming against you? What if it's your flesh, your desires? Now, can I just tell us, we cannot cast out the flesh. What we must do is we must crucify the flesh. This thing, this thing that's always with me. So I have to learn how to surrender. The fourth type of voice is the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of God. So we got the devil's voice. We got the world's voice. We got the flesh's voice. I got to discern these three voices because I don't know where they're coming from. I'm always blaming the devil, but it's really me. And some of us can't crave God because we're so full of ourselves. You can't crave the things of God because you're so full of you. So empty you out of you. And may his spirit fill you up. But what if we don't have an appetite for God because I'm already full of the things of me, the things of the flesh, the things that I desire, my old past, my old ways. I can't crave the things of God because I'm already full. You're full of junk food. You're full of fast food. But how about the things that give you nutrition? I call it soul food. Food for your soul, food for your spirit, things that fill you up. But we love the thing, we love the fast life, the fast food life. So full of you. That's why it's hard to crave the things of God. So what I'm telling us is to move. Get out the way. Let you get out of you. So that the Holy Spirit can get in you and fill you up. This is a daily surrender and a daily desire that we must have for Christ. Go to John chapter 3. As we're talking about, are you carnal? There's this man named Nicodemus. And Jesus actually called him the teacher of Israel. He was known as the teacher of teachers. Nicodemus, John chapter 3. Nicodemus was one of those guys that knew a lot of the word of God. He knew a lot of the, the law and the things of God. 
But could he discern the things in the spirit? I know so many people that know so much of the Bible. Well, brother, I grew up in church. I hear people say, I grew up in church. And the next thing that comes out is nothing that comes from the spirit of God. Well, I was a pastor. I grew up in church. I used to do this. I used to do that. I'm going to audit you by your fruit. And I'm going to look if you got some rotten roots. Rotten roots will produce rotten fruit sometimes. Just because you got fruit doesn't mean it's healthy. Just because you're bearing fruit doesn't mean it's good fruit. Doesn't mean it's healthy fruit. Just because you're spitting scripture or you've memorized verses doesn't mean that I'm really being spirit led. What if it's me? What if it's just me trying to glorify me? Me, myself, and I. John chapter 3, the foundation of our passage today, of our teaching today. John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I love how Nicodemus saw these signs and knew that these signs that were done through Jesus, only God was in that. That takes a level of humility and discernment. But also Nicodemus, it says that he went to go see Jesus by night. Why? Because he was probably a little embarrassed to go see him by day because of what other religious people would have thought of him. Like I'm the teacher of teachers, but I'm seeing something that is only sent by God. And then Jesus, he says, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. These are the language of believers that we can discern the language. This is why I love the word of God, because you could tell me earthly things, but can you believe, but I'm gonna tell you heavenly things and can you believe that? Verse four, Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? See, these are questions we ask, like Jesus saying born again. And it's like, what do you want me to do? Crawl back into my mama's womb and be like, hey, what's up? I'm 31. This is me now, right? Like he's looking at this, like, what, what does this even mean? There are people that are carnally minded and think the same thing. Oh, what the Bible tells me, you can't judge. Matthew 7 says you can't judge. But that, why does John 7, 7, 24 say we can judge with a, with a righteous judgment? The Bible will never contradict itself. So what does that even mean? right? We're so into these one minute cuts on social media that we don't even study context. We love cuts, but do we like context? Verse five, Jesus answered, said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That is which born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Again, this is a man that knew scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. He could probably say the whole book of Isaiah to you, right? Quote all these, all these scriptures from the Old Testament. And he's hearing Jesus and like, how can this stuff even be? Verse 10, Jesus answered, said to him, are you, the, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. 12, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And, Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think that's the simplicity of the gospel is like, just let me just believe Jesus. Let me just believe in him. Let me just receive him as my personal Lord and Savior. Let him be the Lord of my life so I can get access to these things. 
17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let me just share, share a little bit of that. When someone loves darkness more than light, it's attached to their deeds. It's attached to their decisions. And there's this word that continues to rema in my spirit this season. Every decision is tied to a harvest. Every decision is tied to a harvest. So when the deeds are evil, they will love darkness because it's attached to the deeds of being evil. And that is why their harvest is darkness. And that is why they love darkness. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's why when you, name, when you call the name of Jesus, when you mention Jesus, people that are in darkness cannot stand light. He is light. So when light is ever exposing any type of darkness, they hate it because they love their evil deeds more than the light of Christ. They'll take in crystals, but not Christ, right? They'll serve every other random rock and thing they see, shell they see at the, at the beach. But when it's about the rock, the foundation, Jesus Christ, they don't want nothing to be part of it. Because darkness has deceived people into thinking that Jesus is attached to religion. When it's a real relationship with him. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into that religion because people like to argue about religion. Religion is just when, when a set of people believe in something. But the religious spirit that is attached to the Pharisees will try to use the word of God, use the laws of God to try to manipulate you and abuse you. That is the spirit of religion. That is the religious spirit to keep you bound. Not going to go too into, into that. We expose that a lot, but because we've seen so many people through that. Verse 20, for everyone practicing evil hates the light <laughs> and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. People love their dysfunction more than freedom in Christ. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Nicodemus coming to Jesus, he's known as the teacher of Israel. And he saw these signs that Jesus did. And this is what the revelation I'm getting that people will be able to see these things that God is doing. These are real encounters with God and say, that has to be God. And those that have a heart to be open to that, they're going to see. But those that have been bound up because they love the evil, they love the wickedness, they love the darkness, it's going to be hard for them because the light exposes their decisions, their deeds. And they don't want to be exposed. Go to the epistles of John towards the end. 1 John chapter 2. Okay. So we're talking about, obviously, are you a carnal Christian? Carnal Christians... Even though you're developed as a believer, doesn't mean that that carnal temptation will not come upon you. When you are mature in Christ or a developed disciple, you just know how to be able to overcome the flesh that tries to continue to allow me to operate in the flesh. Like if you love worldly music, there is a level that you need to understand of, do I really love God more than I love this world? Do I really love light more than I love the darkness? This is how we expose these things that are through us. And again, this is auditing the, the season and the stage and the age that we're in as followers of Christ. Can I just tell us all that in the spiritual realm, age does not compare to what happens in the physical. I've seen people that have grown in Christ, that have been in Christ two years, than others that have been in church for 20 years. Being in church doesn't transform you. Jesus does. So what I'm learning is that it doesn't matter if you go to Sunday. Again, being in church is good. But being the church is great. And that's being a real disciple and follower of Christ. What would you do to help to serve? The epistles of John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says this. Do not love the world. 
the epistles of John, right? First John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Again, I don't just say these things just because it sounds good, right? Like, I don't want to be with somebody that loves the world more than they love God. Like, this is it. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't serve two masters. You either love one, hate the other, or vice versa. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, what is in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. He who does the will of God. So if I want to be able to overcome the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, I have to be able to abide in his word. To abide is to continuously be in Christ. I set my mind and decisions. Now, I get tempted. Things come at me too. But my maturity and my relationship with God will dictate if I will be able to say, no, I rebuke that, I resist that, I renounce that, I don't receive that, I don't even desire that. When Christ really transforms you, you will no longer desire the things that you used to entertain. Worldly music. Right? Certain TV TV and entertaining things, anything out there, you will no longer crave or want to listen to. That's how you know you're being transformed. That's how you know you're being changed. That's how you know God's really working in you. Now, if you're still craving it a bit, it means that you're still growing up. We don't want to just grow old. We want to grow up. We want to mature. That's what it's going to take. Skip over to chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4. This is what it says, right? It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, there are people that will continue to say things saying it is from God. I once heard this saying that, all scripture was written to us, but not all scripture was written for us. What does that mean? All scripture was written to us, but not all scripture was written for us. Meaning there are assignments and seasons where I'm receiving a direct rema, a word from God. You can't serve everybody. Can we just at least agree on that? You can't serve everyone. You only serve who you're assigned to in this season. Because not all, because all scripture is written to us, but not all scripture is written for us. So we have to know our assignments. We have to know where, where we're planted. We have to know where, where we're at as far as ministry. Some people are mantled for marriage ministry. Others are mantled for children's ministry or prison ministry or a divorce ministry with, with single parents, right? We're, we're all mantled and assigned for different things in the body of Christ. I can't serve everyone. Scripture was written to us, but was all scripture, but scripture was really written for us. Now, it says, be, be, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are, they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, there are going to be people that say things over your life. There's a difference when somebody is operating in the prophetic. There's a difference between purity and and accuracy. Just because somebody is pure doesn't mean they're always accurate. And just because somebody's accurate doesn't mean they're always pure. I mean, we, we see this all throughout scripture. How did, how did Balaam, prophet Balaam, right? And we start studying these things. So there's going to be people that you're going to listen to because they got a pure heart. There, there's purity in them, but is there accuracy in them when it comes to sharing a word. Because many false prophets have gone out in this world, so we must test every spirit if they are of God. Verse 2, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. 
which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. The spirit of the Antichrist is here. Now, based on whatever we believe, whether you believe the actual Antichrist is here, that's between you and the Lord. I'm not going to argue with people on that. But we know that the spirit of the Antichrist is here. And that spirits love to use people. Because the only way for a demonic spirit to be, to be able to function in, its, in, in, in the way it does is it needs a person to allow whatever. If it's lust, it needs a place. If it's addiction, it needs somebody to smoke and to drink. Whatever that spirit is, it needs a person. The spirit of the Antichrist, which you have already... Uh, which you have heard was coming is now already in the world. You, verse four, I love this verse. This is a highlighted verse. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is within you, who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this, we know the spirit of truth, and the spirit of error. These are the types of spirits we got to discern, the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, or the spirit of error, which is attached to the Antichrist that is already in this world. Go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and then we're going to get planted in a few things, and I'm going to give you guys a few things on how to discern the difference between a carnally-minded believer, a carnal Christian, and a kingdom-minded believer. Because let me just tell you, everyone's got a word to share. Oh, well, based on my experiences, bro. Right? We hear this. Why not say based on your encounter with God when you prayed and fasted for me? Like God, you, people, people go through something in the morning and they're like, well, God gave me clarity at night. God isn't always going to speak that quick in your life. Sometimes he's going to allow you to get squeezed and pressed and he's going to test your heart to see if you're really going to seek him. For days and weeks of fasting, of pressing, but we're making quick decisions because of our carnal mind. Now, I'm not saying that you don't have the Holy Spirit. My question is, does the Holy Spirit have you? I don't question that the Spirit of God is in you. I question if the Spirit of God is really using you and, and the fullness of his presence and his glory is in you when you're speaking and when you're sharing these things. There are babes in Christ that are operating as seed, trying to feed people fruit that they don't have. They got oil, for they, they, or they don't have the oil for where they're called to, where, where they're assigned to, or where they think they're called or assigned to, is what I can say. There's a cost to oil. There's a cost to it. Are we there? 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 3, verse 1. Apostle Paul speaking. He says, I, brethren, cannot speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Even Apostle Paul had to share language in a babe form because they're still acting as carnal people. And let me just share it. That's okay. Verse 2, I fed you with milk, warmed it up. Not with solid food, I added the warm. And not with solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. Here's why. If you give a baby a piece of steak and they got no teeth, they're gonna choke. So sometimes I gotta feed you milk in milk form so that you can receive it and get nourished by it. And that's what Apostle Paul's saying. Hey, I fed you with milk. Not with solid food, for until now you are not still able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. There are some things I just can't tell people because it's me. I want to correct them. I want to give them instruction. But sometimes I just got to shut my mouth and pray for them. Because some people, when I tell them, they'll choke on it and they'll think you're coming against them. Y Y'all ever get that? Where some people, when you try to share something that you know is from the Lord, from the Spirit of God, they can't receive steak because they can only receive milk. And sometimes we got to warm it up because that's how much a babe they are. They need warm milk. Verse three, for you are still carnal. You say, I want God's ways, but really you want your way. That's, that's the babes in Christ that I see, the people that are still operating in carnal. Like I want God, I'm striving for God. Yet they, they say that with their lips, but their heart is not aligned. For you are still carnal, carnal for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? 
For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Now, the, 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 the context behind three and four, back in those days, kind of like what goes on today, you'll see it. Some say, I'm, I'm a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of Apollos. I'm a follower of this pastor. And since this pastor disagrees with this pastor, I'm with this pastor, even though this pastor is right. I've been with this pastor. Y'all you know what I mean? So we're arguing because we're following this person. This Follow Jesus, y'all. Pastors can be wrong. Right? These people could be wrong because we're still not perfect. We're people. So whenever there's people involved, sin can still be involved. Imperfections can still be involved. Well, y'all are saying Paulos. Y'all are saying Paul. Aren't you guys mere car carnal because you guys have strife? There's divisions. You're arguing about baptism. You're arguing about speaking in tongues. You're arguing about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You guys are still arguing about these things that are dividing you. You're still carnal. For when I say, when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of, pa of Apollos, are you not carnal? Are you not behaving like mere men? Being in church for 20 years does not make you somebody that is walking in the spirit. I want us to get that clear. Because there's no amount of years you put by being in the house of the Lord that is going to justify how old you are in the spirit. It's how you spend your time with God. It's your fruits. It's your serving the Lord. It's also your surrender. I tell people when they try to plant into a local ministry, it's not how close the ministry is to you. It's not how, how, how close they live to you. It's how close they are to the Bible. It's how close they are to Christ. It's how close they are to his word. That's what it should be. Not because it's just convenient for how close they are to me. I know people that drive across town every week to get to this house. And I know people that live on this side of town that drive across town to get to the house that God has placed them in. It's the Holy Spirit that will give you a home. And you have to know that. Are you not carnal? Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Okay, so I'm going to... I share with you guys what, what it means to be a carnal Christian, okay? I cannot end off by just saying, okay, you're carnal. We got to actually know how to walk in the Spirit so we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh, okay? So this is how we're going to be able to do it. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask for us, we're, we're, we're going to have a, a quick little T-chart and I'm going to break it down, but real quick, Galatians 5.16. Let's read this real quick. Galatians 5.16. He says, I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Y'all see that? Don't even focus on the flesh. Just walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Very simple. You want to not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Just walk in the spirit. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish the flesh and the spirit are constantly warring against one another they do not agree with one another the enemy wants you to fight flesh with flesh you ain't gonna win well when you fight in the spirit you'll be able to overcome the lust of the flesh now when we see here on the board the difference between being carnally minded and kingdom minded this is how I can discern people that are operating in, in, in the flesh. The flesh will contaminate your walk with God. They contaminate your soul. They contaminate your mind. They contaminate your heart. There's contamination. But those that are kingdom-minded, they're going to always be able to direct you towards purity with God. To be pure, it just means this, to be free from corrupt desires. So when somebody is helping you be free from corrupt desires, you're like, okay, that's kingdom that ain't culture. Culture wants to contaminate your walk with God. They want to contaminate your calling. They want to contaminate your purpose. Carnal, it confuses. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. But the kingdom, they bring clarity. There's clarity in my walk. There's clarity in my vision. There's clarity when I'm surrendered to Christ. Carnal people tend to try to confuse us because they want us to do what they want us to do. That's what culture does. 
Carnal, they challenge boundaries. When there's a boundary, a gate, they want to step over you. They want to take advantage of you and you helping them. That's what the carnal mind does to people that are wanting to serve people. But when you start to challenge somebody's boundary, you might be operating in the flesh and using scripture to back up your claim. Ooh, I've seen that so many times. Just because I'm a man of God, just because I love God, you will not challenge my boundaries. There is a boundary I'm building because I want you to be set free. Not take advantage of the blessings of God. What if you have cursed you? Kingdom people, they create boundaries. Creating boundaries is so that we don't take advantage of things that are of God. Carnal people, they run away. They run away from stuff. They're like Jonah, run away from the presence of God. Then storms follow them. They're paying unnecessary fees to fares because they're running away from God. They're running away from their calling. They're running away just to look like somebody on social media. They're not. Kingdom people, they create runways, solutions. He makes a way when there seems to be no way. He makes rivers in the desert and roads in the wilderness. He splits the sea. They make runways. They make every crooked path straight, God, and every rough place smooth. Carnal people, they resist God. They resist God. They resist the things of the Lord. Kingdom people, they surrender to God. Lord, I surrender to you. It doesn't make sense because it, it messes my image or it messes my ego up, but you got to surrender. You don't understand the things of God, especially when you're a babe in Christ. Even me sometimes, I don't even understand some things. But Lord, I trust you. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not on my own understanding in all thy ways. I shall acknowledge him and he shall direct. Surrender, that's what surrender to God is. Carnal, carnal and culture, they tell you to fall in love. While kingdom people, they walk in love. Fall in love versus walking in love. Falling in love to me is a feeling. Walking in love is an action. I'm going to love you even though you might not deserve it, but there's some people where you got to love from a distance. That will set some people free. I'm going to love you, but I'm going to love you from a distance. Because if I love you the way you want me to love you, that ain't love, that's lust. I'm serving your dysfunction. Again, things that we talk to a lot deeper in, these, in this house. Carnal, it's all about self. The flesh wants to glorify self. The flesh wants to glorify you. The kingdom wants to glorify God. The spirit wants to glorify God. That's walking in the spirit. I'm glorifying God. Carnal, they take. That's all they do. They're just takers. They just love taking from you. Well, I thought you were a Christian. You should help me. They, and that's all they do. They take. Kingdom, they give. They give. Greater is no love than this than one who has laid his life down for a friend. John 15, 13. Carnal is impatient. The kingdom, they are patient. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not boast in itself. Love rejoices in the truth. So, when we're discerning these, I want us to discern the difference between being carnally minded and kingdom minded. Have I fallen short of some of these things on the carnal side? I have. But that's why I don't focus on me being perfect. I focus on the one that is perfect. The author, defender, the perfecter of my faith. The finisher of my faith. We're still in Galatians, right? I say, walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. They're warring against one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, here are some more things on the works of the flesh. And then I'm going to give us some, some keys to closing out. The work of the flesh is actually broken down into four categories. I don't know if you guys have studied this. We've studied this quite a few times. But there are four categories when we're studying the works of the flesh. The first category is sexual immorality. That is the first category of the work of the flesh, sexual immorality. And these are one of the things in the Bible that's clear we got to run away from. Flee from sexual immorality. You're like, just run. Don't even try to face it, right? And what are those, what is that category here in the works of the flesh? 
For the works of the flesh are evidence. Here they are, the four things. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness. That is the first category of the work of the flesh, sexual impurity. The second category is occults. Occults. And you see that in verse 20. It is those two, idolatry and sorcery. That is under the occult category of the works of the flesh. Idolatry, anything you put above God, that's an idol. Your relationship, your bank account, your title, your degree, anything above God becomes an idol. Somebody else's opinion on your life, how they influence us. Your significant other might love you and care for you, but is that really from God? You have made their opinion on your life an idol. Occults is what idolatry and sorcery. The third type of category that we see of the work of the flesh is pride, right? The pride of life is what we say, that's why we can't, and here's all the stuff that's pride, okay? It is, it's uh, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions. Whew. Dissensions, heresies, envy, okay? Murders, these are, these are all pride, by the way. That's all in that category under pride. That, that's, that's a lot right there, but that's all under, under pride, okay? Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, okay? That's all under pride, that category of the work of the flesh. The fourth category that we're seeing, and it's those last two, self-indulgent self-indulgent. This is the fourth category of the work of the flesh. When we categorize them, it's a lot easier to discern them, right? Self-indulgent is what? Drunkenness, revelry, revelries. And the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I got a different revelation around this. It's not that you're not going to inherit heaven, and salvation, that's not just the revelation that I'm, I'm getting. And those that practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Meaning, if you want God's blessing today, if you want God's inheritance in your life today, you will not practice these things continuously. Y'all get that? Like, you could still be saved, but still try to practice these things and allow the flesh, but we want on earth as it is in heaven. I want to be able to encounter heavenly blessings today in this lifetime, not just wait until Jesus Christ comes back. Jesus says that the kingdom of God is within. So then if I have the kingdom of God within me, when I don't practice these things, I can inherit the things of the kingdom today. That I am seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because I'm seated in the heavenlies, I'm able to get access to the throne. And get access to the blessings. That's why the word today is when you have a relationship with God, it will give you the access to things that money and titles and degrees can't give you. Because you have a relationship with God. And you're willing to walk in the spirit so you do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is another word for long-suffering is patience. Why is long-suffering patience? Because when you suffer long, you've built patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Meaning the Spirit of God can overcome the things of the flesh in our life. If we allow it, I'm not questioning if you have the Holy Spirit. I, I question if the Holy Spirit has you when boo-boo over there said some boo-boo stuff to you. Can I overcome this with this, the works of the Spirit or the fruits of the Spirit? And let me just tell y'all, fruits take time to grow. So you grow in these fruits. So I'm not exp expecting us to bear these fruits today if we just planted these seeds yesterday. It's a process. And that's why I expose the carnal Christian, the babes in Christ. Why am I exposing that? Because I want us to expose the season we're in and be okay with it to know I'm growing in Christ Jesus. I'm not here to condemn. I, I want the Holy Spirit to convict us, to change us. This is how you're going to know the difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation, 
which is not of God, and conviction, which only the Holy Spirit does. This is what condemnation is. Condemnation says you're a mistake. Conviction says you made a mistake. Here's how you can get better. Here's how you can fix it. That's Holy Spirit conviction. God always gives an answer to our mistakes. But condemnation just says you're a mistake. You're not that great. You're not good. You can't do it anymore. That's condemnation. That is not of God. That's what religion does. Religion is saying, oh my gosh, I, I, I messed up. My dad's going to kill me. Conviction is saying, I messed up. I got to go tell dad. I can have an open conversation with my father in my brokenness, in my pain, in my hurt. I'm not scared to take what I'm messing up in to him at his feet. Say, Jesus, help me. Take this brokenness and put me together. I'm not perfect. Verse 24, and those who are Christ, are you a child of God? And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. When you are his, you have crucified your flesh or learned to because the flesh has its own passions. The flesh has its own desires. If we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. Don't let me just say I'm living it. I'm walking it. Be about it. Verse 26, let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I once heard this, never let your lips and your living preach two different messages. Your lips says one thing, but my living says another. You know what Jesus calls them? Hypocrites. You want to hear Jesus call these, these hypocrites out? Go read the full, uh, uh, the full chapter of Matthew 23. He calls these religious people hypocrites. A hypocrite has lips service, but not living service. Okay. Now, we talked about this. Let me just, just talk about how to crucify the flesh. Maybe that's how we can start off. Three ways on how to crucify the flesh. Go to Galatians 2. Galatians 2.20. The first way to crucify the flesh, okay? I didn't just go so deep into the flesh and say walk in the spirit just for us to not have any keys to know how to, how to be able to crucify our flesh. We need to crucify. You can't cast out the flesh, but you could crucify it. How do I crucify the flesh? Number one, we must decide to crucify our flesh. So number one is we got to decide. Just decide you want to follow Jesus. Just decide you're willing to crucify the flesh. Just decide. Okay? That's what the enemy wants us to do, to influence us, to, to say, oh, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. Just decide I'm following Jesus. I love Jesus. Just say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus more than I love the world. I'm deciding. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We must decide to crucify our flesh. That's number one, okay? Go, number two, go to Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine. I love hearing pages turn. As I'm turning pages, may the, the prophecies and promises of God rema in this room. May his living word, his spoken word, rema in this environment. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. How do we crucify the flesh? Number two, we must deny ourselves. We must deny ourselves, okay? And that's a hard thing to do because you lived with you. But now you are living in Christ. So it's a new way of thinking, a new way of moving. Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus, if I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can I tell you heavenly things and believe? You have to deny you and your flesh and yourself. Luke chapter nine, verse 23. Then Jesus said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is in himself destroyed or lost? 
Another saying says, what profits a man that gains the whole world and loses his soul? Verse 26, for whoever is ashamed of Jesus, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, my promises, my ways, my truth, my path, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste the death until they see the kingdom of God. Father God, teach us how to see. Teach us how to see in the spiritual realm. I'm telling y'all, as I continue to get in his word daily, years and years in, I'm still seeing new things. And I thank God for these this, this ability to see. I don't see everything, but I see whatever God is unveiling or showing me that's right in front. See, I want to be able to see. So we must deny ourselves. Go to number three. Go to Psalm chapter one. And we're going we're gonna to close out in Psalm one here. Position ourselves. Psalm chapter one. One of my favorite chapters in Psalm, just because you can meditate on this, for all types of areas in your life, no matter what it is, whether you're building communities or you're leading people or you might be building a business or you might be pouring into other people or you might just want to get closer with the Lord and build that relationship and what that process looks like to be able to get to the promise. You know, I tell people, if you can't serve the process, how can you expect to gain the promise, right? So how to crucify the flesh, number three, we must meditate on God's word daily. We must meditate on God's word daily. Why, why do we have to meditate on God's word daily? Because God's word breaks the cravings of the flesh. That's a word right there. God's word breaks the cravings of the flesh. So this is why we have to meditate on his ways, his precepts, his instructions. Because there's a lot that goes out there. There's a lot of noise that goes out there. There's things that even try to influence me. And I'm like, no, Lord, I got I to gotta pivot. Some of us just got to switch lanes. Get out of that lane, right? Pivot. God's word breaks the cravings of the flesh. So we must meditate on God's word daily. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. I shared that earlier about counsel. Nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I'm not just standing in the path of, of, of demons. I'm not just sitting in the seats with demons. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. To meditate, it's to reflect, to ponder, to moan, to mutter. That's meditating. I'm not just, I'm not just uh, uh, reflecting on God's word. I'm not just pondering on God's word. I'm also moaning and muttering it. I'm also uttering it from my mouth. That's what meditate, that's what real meditation is. This is why I tell people, don't just pray with your, I've seen people like online, they'll pray with their, with, with, they'll just pray like this. And then they'll do the cross that doesn't do nothing, right? Like it's like, let's pray some bold prayers with our lips and with our mouth so that it remas into an atmosphere so I can plant seeds into an environment and take dominion in the spiritual realm. Father, in Jesus' name, I plant these seeds right now. I call upon your mighty, mighty name, O oh God, that you would just rema in this atmosphere and let those that hear every word, every truth, every seed that has been planted into the souls of your people, cover it, protect it, water it, sustain it. We plant, we water, but it is you, God, that gives the increase. And I pray that they glorify you so that they may continue to bear much fruit. In Jesus' name. Verse 3 he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, shall not go dry, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. See, you, you guys know what I see that? They're like the chaff that the wind drives away. It's these, these dry leaves or things that fall off from the vine and the wind drives it away. What happens? They just fall off and the voice and the, and, and, and the noise of this world, the drowning and the echoes of the opinions of this world, this drives them into, into confusion. Drives, it, it just waters them away. That's what the wind does to these people. When you are under the counsel of the ungodly, 
You get confused on where you should go. And just because it's an increase, you think it's from God. The devil also has resources, titles, money, all sorts of resources. The, the devil could even give increase. Jesus, if you just bow down to me and worship me, I'm going to give you everything you see. You know what's funny? He couldn't even give him everything he sees. <laughs> that was another lie from the enemy. But what does Jesus say? He uses the word of God. He says three things. It is written. So when I can use God's word, when I'm getting tempted by the enemy, God's word will break the cravings of the flesh. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I want us to discern some things here. Three W's, I'm, I'm closing out. I don't have no, nothing fancy to close out. It's just sharing the, the unadulterated, uncompromised word of God, okay? That's all, that's all we do. Some days I'll probably have some stuff, but today I don't have a, a thing that's going to light us up and inspire us. I pray that God's word inspires you already. We have to understand God's will. We have to understand God's way. And here's another thing that a lot of people fall short of, God's when. God's will, God's way, and God's when. Some of us need to take the step today. Others, God is giving you a revelation today, and the when is later on in a different season. But I think a lot of people, they, they start to really seek. And here's the thing. When I'm asking God for when, I usually go through a fast. Because if I don't really have clarity, and I'm not talking about just stopping yourself from e eating any food. I'm saying get away from worldly music. Get away from things that entertain you. Get away from even people that are speaking and have voices and probably influence in other industries that are speaking to you, but not giving you godly, heavenly wisdom. You have to cut off all the noise. In this season, I'm cutting off a lot of noise. Why? Because everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's got a mic. Everyone's got a voice. Everyone's got access to your DMs and your messenger. Some, some of them have access to you and your phone number. And they're stopping you or hindering you from doing things that God wants you to do today. Or they're getting you to do other things that God says, that's not the time. So God's will is found in God's word. That's how I line it. God's will, God's ways. That's righteousness. That's holiness. That's, that's operating as a kingdom-minded person. God's ways, all, all right there. If, it, if it's attached to any of those, then it, it must be the way of the Lord. He is the way, the truth, the life. But I think a lot of us need to understand God's when. God's when. I love being around people that aren't moving just because they have to move, but are moving in clarity, in provision, under God's mighty hand that's on them. And can I just share? I, I'll never forget this scripture where back in the day, when Samuel was getting raised up as a prophet, the Bible says this, that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. The word of the Lord was rare in those days as prophet Samuel was being rise, wrote, risen up, but he heard the Lord. What I'm believing as we're going through this counterfeit series is there's so many counterfeits out there, millions, but there's only one true voice. And just because these people go to church, they got stuff tatted on them, they got a big influence, they got a big, big community, I will qu always question what spirit that comes from. We got people that have grown a following from things that go viral, but nothing that they have been, and, and now they're talking on topics they're not even assigned to. And now we have seen that and we have, we have really attached to that and thought that's a rema for me. All scripture was written to us, but was all scripture written for us? God's will, God's way, God's when. Anybody that is not of the Lord, there are some of us in here in this room today, you need to cut off from that. And whenever you have red flags, I don't know who I'm speaking to, but whenever there are red flags early on, God is giving you warning signs so that you don't say yes anymore. So you can cut off from these counterfeit contracts. Why do we say we want to continue to serve God, yet we're sowing into the devil? We're sowing into the world. 
We're sowing into people that are exalting themselves. Why is the world the one that are running all these things out there when the kingdom has so much access to wisdom that this world does not have access to? Yet we're bowing down to that. We're compromising our calling for that. Are you a carnal Christian? Are you carnally minded? Are you kingdom minded? I pray the Holy Spirit does what he has to do in this house and that we can separate ourselves from the world so that we can really consecrate ourselves and hear from God. Like I want to position myself to hear from the Father. Everyone here is different. You guys are all dealing with different battles. You guys are all dealing with different Goliaths or, or giants and it's okay to deal with giants. That's the testing to see if it's time for you to finally sit on a throne and where God wants to position you. When I say throne, I'm not saying everyone here is going to be a king. I'm saying there's a position that God has for us in the kingdom. But also some of us want to be King David so bad that we don't want to be Prophet Samuel. Prophet Samuel was not the king, but what he was was a king maker. And some people want to be king so bad, but some people need to be positioned in the kingdom as a king maker. Prophet Samuel, you're going to take, the, he ain't the king no more. How long will you mourn for Saul? I got a new king. You shall anoint him. Know your position in the kingdom. The reason why we're studying counterfeits and I got something exciting we're going to be going into into this next season because I, I, I'm, I'm hearing right now that in the summer, throughout this next summer, that there's going to be people that need healing. And we're going to get deep. And it's going to really allow us. Some people think they're healed the moment they receive Jesus. You're not healed the moment you receive Jesus. You still got to go through recovery season. And Jesus will expose the things you still need healing from, from toxic situations, environments, people that have hurt us, family that has uh, allowed us to operate in dysfunction because of what they've labeled us as. It's time for us to heal from that so that we can really be free as kingdom people. Anyone that needs any prayer, we're going to open this up. I'm going to call up uh, Pastor Andrew to, to close us out in prayer. But I just want to pray real quick. Father, in, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, because we're just here to get taught. We're here to learn. We're here to be, be challenged, and we're here to grow. God, we desire in this house for, for your disciples to grow. We desire for your disciples to mature, to get better, not bitter but to be able to be people, oh Lord, that serves others, that knows how to wash feet for others, that knows how to serve people so they, they can be healed from anything like the spirit of rejection, the spirit of fear, any anxiety that comes upon people, oh God, any insecurity. We want to be able to help them and heal them through that process. So God, we understand that it is up to us to be healthy and whole as individuals so that we don't serve other people's dysfunction that are going through a healing process. I think there's some people in the body of Christ that are trying to help other people while they're still wounded. There are still other people that are still trying to help other people walk when they're still trying to crawl. So God, in this season, if it's time for me to water me, if it's time for you to water you, I pray that you have real encounters with the living God and that you put him above everything else so that you could be a vessel, you could be a light, you could be an instrument for those people that you're going to be assigned to in the later seasons to heal. I don't want us to think that doing ministry is just being able to help others when Jesus is trying to help you first. So God, whatever that looks like in this season, you know our hearts, you know our desires. We understand, God, that you position us according to the purpose and the season that you have placed us in. So, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be whole, healthy, and just strive for healing in this season ahead, to strive to be able to be on you, the rock, the firm foundation, to be able to find a real community, to get real godly counsel, to be able, oh God, to get that real godly covering, oh God. I pray for people in the body of Christ across the nation that are looking for healthy ministries, healthy communities, healthy covering, that you make a way when there seems to be no way, oh God. And I pray that you would bless those houses that have not compromised, oh God, what you already did on the cross of Calvary. And you will provide for them. And you will bring real helpers, real disciples, oh God, to sow in to that house in the way that they serve. I personally desire people to get developed because I know that when you get on the other side of the one that's not just being served, but the one that is serving, there's so much purpose attached to being a servant. Just as Jesus says, the greatest 
the, the greatest in the kingdom is the one that is the least. And what he says are the ones that serve. But God positioned us to go through that healing so that we could be of service to the broken. Hallelujah, Lord.